The bottom line, though, is that we as a nation have crossed the Rubicon when it comes to free money and cannot turn back without possibly crushing the stock and housing market and wiping out the wealth effect. I want to bring in now from the Bonson Group, their managing partner, David Bonson. David, uh, in your newest book, There Is No Free Lunch, <laughs> uh, I don't know. That means that there's going to be some kind of serious banquet or feast to pay for all of this. I mean, eventually, who pays for this tab? Well, it gets paid for by future generations, and the consequence is, I think, lower economic growth, the stagnation effect that comes from excessive fiscal policy, spending too much money, and excessive monetary policy that really misallocates capital, Charles. And we've seen it play out in Japan, um, and I believe that it gets paid by other generations, which is why politicians and policymakers are able to continue with things that don't really work because they're not generally the ones who have to pay for it. So to that point, David, just if we're looking at Japan, imagine we're already seeing signs that, that our birth rates have dropped considerably. So we're gonna have lower birth rates, higher interest payments at some point, can we even conceivably ever pay it all off? Will this be sort of a dark shadow that harms future generations, not just one generation, but multiple generations for a long time to come? Well, I do not believe we'll ever pay it off, but I don't think any government or municipality ever pays off debt. All they do, best case scenario, is stop growing their debt and just roll over their debt year over year and decade over decade. There are very few examples in history of a developed and civilized society reducing gross debt levels. I will push back, Charles. I'm not sure that the interest cost will go higher. I think there's every motivation in the world for the U.S. to Japanify to stay near the zero bound for decade upon decade. And people go, well, how can they do it? Japan's done it for 30 years. So I think those disinflationary effects are going to prove to be just as problematic as the inflationary effects that we're facing right now, right. which I do happen to believe are on the supply side. And so ultimately, I want the supply side to resolve this. I want more goods and more services. And that's our problem. We don't have the engine of wealth creation that we need and that we're capable of in this society. You know, by the way, I, I tend to agree with everything you just said. I got less than a minute to go. Let me get to the markets. You've made people a lot of money in master limited partnerships and some of these other energy related positions. Oil's down a lot here. Are you changing your positions on anything? Or are you buying this dip? Oh, no, we're buying this dip. There's a lot of reason to believe that the few times energy has dipped this year uh, represented a great uh, entry point. Um, we do not believe that there is something sustainable on the supply side. Uh, the, ultimately, Charles, here's what we have in the energy story. A world, not just a country, a world that needs more U.S. oil and gas, especially natural gas. There's a di dispersion right now between what's happening with oil prices and natural gas. Mm -hmm. And what we need is to be able to store it, and we certainly need to transport it. Look to UMI. UMI is the ticker for an ETF that does a lot of these midstream uh, oil and gas related transportation plays. Big juicy yields, great financial fundamentals. David, always appreciate our conversations and the great ideas. You've been rocking, my friend. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Charles.